Hi everyone, thanks for joining us today. Today's edition of Ask an Airstreamer is all about traveling with your furry or feathered companion. It's probably not a surprise that traveling with your pet is a common activity in the Airstream community. And while our panelists will share their experience today with their dog Reacher, many of the tips we discussed today will apply to most types of pets. By the end of today's session, we hope you'll walk away with a little bit more knowledge about traveling with your pet in your Airstream. Before introducing our panelists, I want to take a moment to introduce myself. My name is Chris, and in addition to being an Airstream owner myself, I get to work with Airstream's brand ambassadors, helping to share their stories of adventure, curiosity, and exploration in their Airstream. A few housekeeping items before we get started. Today's session is being recorded and will be published on Airstream.com next week alongside other editions of Ask an Airstreamer. In other words, don't worry about writing everything down. You'll receive an email to this video later next week. To submit your questions at any point today, go ahead and click the Q&A button at the bottom of this screen. We'll do our best to answer all of them, but if we run out of time, we'll share an email address at the end to submit your questions. Towards the end of today's session, we'll share a promo code for Airstream Supply Company, which is part magazine, part travel guide, and part outfitter. And lastly, there's a two question survey that will be emailed right after we wrap up today. We'd love your feedback so we can learn what you liked and things we could do better in future editions. Also, feel free to share future topic ideas for Ask an Airstreamer. Let's take a look at what we're going to cover. So first we'll get to know our panelists a little bit, Mark and Angela, who have a couple of years under their belt traveling with their dog Reacher, who's pictured on the screen. We'll cover some travel prep and must have documentation. We'll talk about planning tools for a smooth trip, tips on where you can take your pet, must have gear to make the whole experience easier and how to keep your pet safe while traveling. So Mark and Angela, thank you so much for taking some time to join us. Welcome, please tell us a little bit about where you are, what you do and how long you've been air streaming. Well, thank you very much for having us and for joining us. We're coming to you today from uh, finally a snowy park city out in Utah. We've been living here for about three and a half years um, uh, since we moved um, our lives, uh, including our dog and our business here to the United States. We make um, um, outdoor gear for dogs and uh, we had always had a dream while living back in New Zealand of traveling the United States um, both for our own play, but also for developing our business um, in a little Airstream. And we had literally talked about it for a decade. And then one of the first things that we bought when we came to the US uh, with our little nest egg was actually an Airstream base camp, which we affectionately call Rover. And it does double duty uh, as a, well, a ginormous billboard because it's very heavily graphic. Um, it's also um, what we stay in when we travel for most of the time. It serves as a pop-up shop. It's a trailer. Uh, it's even been an office for me um, during the last year as well when I needed some peace and quiet. So we get a huge amount of uh, joy and also live, uh, work out of, out of our Airstream. Um, yeah, as I say, we'd always dreamed of doing it. And now that dream is really a reality for us. And Reacher is a huge part of that dream. He was pretty much born for this. He was to the, to the Airstream born and he absolutely loves coming out on the road with us. That's that's great. So we'll have the perspective of not only you know traveling domestically mm -hmm. uh, in an airstream with a pet, but you also guys have some good experience of of, of even traveling internationally on an airplane. So some good good perspective to fold into today's discussion. Yes. Uh, pro probably not a surprise to a lot of folks who are on the on the uh, webinar today, but about sixty percent of airstreamers travel with pets. We've talked to a lot of owners and uh, you know, pet owners are actually more likely to purchase an Airstream because they want to bring their pets along with them when they travel. Traveling with an Airstream and a pet much, much easier than finding pet friendly accommodations on, you know, on the road or in a hotel. So we survey a lot of folks, uh, a lot of owners, most people, not surprisingly, travel with dogs and cats. Uh, but there are a few interesting ones that we've heard about in addition to those two that I'm going to share. So we have people who travel with uh, pet parrots, uh, some folks who travel with a goat. Um, interestingly enough, I've never thought about a rat as a pet, but there are some folks who, who completed the survey and said that they did that. Uh, a Russian tortoise, and uh, I think the most unique one is Winnie the Mini Dachshund, which is UK's first clone dog. Um, 
So again, Mark and Angela will share their experience to their dog today, but remember a lot of what we're talking about from a planning standpoint uh, and preparation standpoint will apply to a, a, a lot of different types of pets. So if you could kind of kick us off, why, you know, why do you travel with your dog? What are the, the, some of the things that you do uh, with Reacher when he's out and about with you guys? Well, I think Mark answered this question best the other day. Oh, by the way, everyone listening, I barely let Mark get a word in ever. So don't be alarmed at that. It's usual. It's very typical. Um, but um, why would you not travel with, with your animals? And um, I do laugh at the idea of traveling with a goat. And I'm very surprised that nobody is traveling with a pig because um, they are very popular right now. In fact, I believe pigs are the new pet goat. Uh, but um, we absolutely love spending time with our dog. He is he is our family and he loves to do the things that we do so um, actually I feel quite odd walking outdoors without him he's very, he is so very much a part of all of the things we love to do whether it's biking or stand up paddle boarding hiking um, sitting outside ca cafes and really cool towns he is just so much a part of that and I do get kind of a bit of an attack of the guilt if I ever leave him behind even though I know he's perfectly safe and comfortable and just doing what he does but the idea of, of not having with us enjoying all this big adventure that we're on um, is, is huge there is also the added thing for us that he is an ambassador dog and he does attract attention and so having him there is also a really nice way of breaking the ice with people and we have met uh, some incredible people as we have traveled across America it is an amazing country with amazing people I mean, he's been from places like the nuclear reactor at Arco yeah. um, to the psychiatric museum yeah. in St. Joseph, Missouri. So we literally, and we try, we, we take him and, and like, if we can get him in, we get him in. So yeah, he visited the uh, first nuclear breeder reactor um, in Arco, Idaho. He's had his nose in the core of a nuclear reactor. And he also was allowed in the incredibly fascinating, if you're ever there, psychiatric museum in St. Joseph, Missouri. So we just and we just love telling people about the places he's been as well. He's at about 22 states now. So yeah, it's the it's well, huge fun. Well, a well traveled dog. When we were doing our, our run through the other day, uh, you, you brought some good insight. You know, you guys are around pets all the time. Um, so we, this idea of what you see at home will only be amplified with with mm -hmm. when you take your pet out uh, in in kind of in the airstream. Tell us yeah. a little bit more about that and then how to uh, how to help how to do that make the pet feel it's exactly right. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, so um, it's absolutely true, Chris. If your dog is a handful at home, it's going to be a ginormous handful on the road. So any behavior that they have, whether it's a behavior that you accept and, and agree with, or a behavior that irritates you or is, is problematic is going to be amplified on the road. So if they bolt through doors, or if they bark at windows, or if they um, are a bit unpredictable and you know hyperactive in the house, those things can really be amplified when you're on the road. So one of the, we are incredibly lucky in that Reacher naturally has a very calm disposition, but he is by no means an angel. And every dog I've always ever met um, has one thing, like every single one of those dogs in that photograph is great, but. And so um, we have had to really work on some behaviors with Reacher at home where he can learn to make sure that he doesn't make bad decisions when we're out on the road for him that mainly related to not running out of doorways not jumping out of the car until he was told so really exercising some impulse control and so that was the really big thing that we worked on with him but we did it at home because that's where they're most able to learn and then when we go out on the road it's all about consistency 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 so the same rules the same schedules the same food um, we take his mat with us so that we know that wherever we go whether it's a cafe or a museum or a hotel if we have to sleep a night in a hotel we can put that on the ground and he knows that that is very much his place 
So really, really keeping to those routines, even things, and I, you know, I, you can't talk about traveling with animals without talking about toileting. And even those kinds of things, if you keep the same food, if you keep the same feeding schedule, um, then all of those things um, just don't become problems. And then you're free to just enjoy it. And the one thing I always say to people, because they come up to us, how do you do it? And, you know, he's so good. And, and it's like, we keep to his routine, we give him the exercise he needs. So if he does have a long day in the car, at least he trusts that at some point he is going to go and be able to get some yayas out and have a, a good old zoomy. So yeah, we're really, really big on routine and we cut him some slack. You know, we are asking him often to do some things that are pretty challenging for a dog, like being in a car for a long period of time or having to, you know, sleep in a, in a different space or where there's lots of different different smells around so we do always make sure that we don't come down on him too hard with discipline but we always make sure that we've set him up for success before we go possibly the only thing he has learned is to alert us when we pass mcdonald's yes that's true um it's a shameful secret of the hook uh, family that the dog um, identifies the McDonald's arches. Um, he well, will literally go from a dead sleep um, to nose at, to a hash brown. The, to, at the window for a hash brown. It's it's crazy. They can learn anything, it would seem. Just, Either that or just, McDonald's are brilliant, one or the other. Yeah, just in case you miss it, always good to have those extra eyes. One idea that we talk about, I uh, think in this, all, all of these webinars that we do is um, you don't have to have, make your first time going actually taking your airstream and going out in the middle of nowhere. If, <laughs> if a lot of this is about getting your pet comfortable with being inside the airstream, mm -hmm. um, I know some folks are fortunate enough to be able to store their airstream where they live, which is, which is awesome. Um, but even you know, pulling it up in front of the house or going to where you store it and mm. spending a night there, right? Remove some of the stress from yourself and from the pet uh, yeah. and take baby steps in, into uh, you know, getting, being successful yeah. in this. So, Absolutely. Absolutely. This next section talks a lot about preparation and there's a there's a lot of good tips in here that talk about things you should do or plan for uh, in advance to make sure you have a, a smooth ride. So uh, I'll let you walk us through this slide here. Uh, and then I'll start to uh, answer some of the questions that are coming sure, in. Sure, sure. So of course we um, had our first experience really traveling with Reacher was international coming from a place where we have very little to worry about. We don't have rabies. Um, we don't have a huge amount of, of other um, ticks and waterborne illnesses and things like that. We're, New Zealand's a, a relatively easy place in that respect. So Reacher really had to have a slew of vaccinations um, and assessments before he traveled internationally. And I think what that really taught us was to be um, very, very disciplined about keeping those records, backing those records up, having them with you, and also knowing what they contain. So we, we don't just have that thing hidden away. It's kind of a living document for us. So we, we know what Reacher has had and when he's due and things like that. So that's just good animal kind of ownership. We, um, we always keep his um, vaccination or his little passport pack in the glove box of our car. And then we have a backup copy, um, both on the cloud and also a physical paper copy. And our relationship with our vet is really important because we know that we can call her and go, hey, for some reason we can't find this or haven't got that or do we need to be worried about this and all of those records are kind of in one place and backed up. Um, some places, um, so campgrounds in particular may ask to see vaccination records and we're going to talk about a couple of the things that, that they may look for specifically but just make sure you have those and they are up to date. Um, vet inspection records are interesting. Um, they might be required when you go across um, an international border or into a very specific protected place. Um, so I would, and that was very much our case when coming from New Zealand. So I'd just be really clear on where we were going and just make sure ahead of time that there was nothing that we needed to be, to be mindful of. Um, I think everybody has about two and a half thousand photographs on their phone of their dog. Um, print a couple out 
because if you got if you are going out looking at you know you've got those photographs you don't have to find a printer if you, you know if the worst happens and your dog goes missing have photographs um, of your dog not just as a brag book but also they do serve quite an important um, purpose. Um, proof of ownership is an interesting one. Your vaccination record should have that inside it. We also um, go quite um, low tech on that and that we do keep um, a, a, a little card in our car that says um, we've we've got a dog traveling with us if we're in an accident and you can't find him please look for him um so there are there are little things that we do that are absolute worst case scenario you know armageddon type things and but they are there so that we're not scrambling um trying to find things at the last minute um, if your dog has any special um, allergies or medical conditions or sensitivities, even if they're behavioral, um, it's a really good idea to just have those kind of noted down somewhere as part of their little travel pack. And finally, um, vet contact and a third person who was not with you contact information. And again, that's Armageddon stuff but it is there so that if the worst happens, that is not one extra layer of stress that you're piling onto things. I guess the only thing to add to that would be if your dog is microchipped, then if he does get away and has lost his collar, then the vet or whoever can scan yes. and have your details. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I would assume that most dogs, whether you get them from a rescue or they are from you know, a, a breeder or whatever here in the United States would be microchipped. That would seem like a fairly baseline thing, but we still, you know, not everyone has a microchip reader. So we always make sure that there is a collar tag on with contact information as well, so. We talked to, uh, at a high level about uh, mm -hmm. some of the vaccinations and, and things to do in advance. Walk us through the, the different columns on this slide. Yeah, so we're obviously not veterinarians, but um, we, we do try and keep up with these kinds of things. Uh, and I've kind of put these into three buckets, if you like, and one is vet required. Um, it doesn't matter where you're going, you always need them and they need to be administered by your veterinarian. Um, the first one is a, is a rabies vaccination, an up-to-date rabies vaccination. And here is a warning uh, for those who think the dog doesn't need to wear the tag, please have the tag on their collar because not only does that provide um, proof of rabies vaccination that you that is right there with your dog, it also does serve as another form of ID because it will have your home county on it. So it's another form of ID. Um, another one is the border teller vaccine. So that's a, a kennel cough. Um, that is, if you're going anywhere where there's lots of dogs um, or if you think that when you're traveling, maybe you're going to put, want to put your dog into a, a daycare or a boarding while you go and do something, those places are going to require that uh, evidence of that vaccination. Now, there are some others that um, are vet required, but they might be more location or season dependent. When we bought Reacher from New Zealand, he had to have so many vaccinations and we definitely noticed a toll that they took. And to be clear, we are very pro-vaccination. Prevention is always better than cure. You may have noticed that I always plan for the disaster. Um, that's just my personality. Um, <laughs> I mean, I'm literally, I'm plugged into the internet. I've got notes. I've got another computer standing by should the worst happen. I'm a safety girl. Uh, but we are also really mindful that over vaccination comes with, particularly for lots of different things and in a short space of time can really cause problems. So um, there are some things that, that are there that we are a little more judicious with and your relationship with your your, your home vet is so important. We actually have um, two, they're partners in a firm. One is more holistic, the other one is very sciencey. And so we, we use Magali and Kim and are really, uh, really often just to sound these things out. Um, depending on where you're going, we live in Utah, uh, rattlesnake. So um, that's a pretty serious thing. Now, there is a rattlesnake vaccine. Uh, we actually decided to go the rattlesnake aversion uh, route, which was more of a behavioral thing. And I think we're, we're gonna talk about that 
um, a little bit as well. Um, yeah, if you live in an area where there is a Lyme's disease, then there is a vaccine against um, Lyme's. Absolutely keep up your flea and tick prevention. Um, we don't do that through the winter simply because it's so cold here that the risk is so low. Uh, and we also live at quite a high elevation. But once summer comes, we start preparing Reacher and get those things back in, into sequence again. Uh, leptospirosis is an interesting one. That particular vaccine, our advice has been, is, is quite hard on the dogs. And if you don't have to give it, then maybe don't. But if you are going somewhere um, in... It is, it is across the US, but it is more prevalent in places. Uh, California and Texas um, have, have kind of been shown up, um, but also anywhere where there's a lot of, it's a waterborne um, and soil contaminated um, source. Anywhere where there's a, prone to flooding or there's wetlands and things like that, you are more likely to come across leptospirosis. So I would definitely speak to uh, my vet before I was going to anywhere where I wasn't sure about that. Uh, and heartworm, an incredibly preventable um, disease and horrible should your dog get it. The treatment for heartworm is, is pretty nasty. So um, treating for heart, well, heartworm prevention is very much a part of Reach's routine. Again, um, because of where we live through the summer, we absolutely do it. But through the winter, we don't because he's not going to places where um, heartworm is prevalent and there is a mosquito that carries that particular pathogen and it dies when the temperature hits 50 degrees Fahrenheit. So anywhere where the temperature is going below 50, we simply give him a break from that heartworm. And because the medication is so effective, you can just pick that up again, um, or we, we pick that up again when we start to travel. And then of course, you've got the no vet required and just good animal care, flea and tick treatments. Um, we bathe Reacher in a really nice kind of skin conditioning shampoo. We use paw balm and all kinds of different things that through the year to help keep him healthy. So by the time we hit the road he's not leaving uh with anything kind of left untreated so so good to consider uh not just the things that you're used to where you live but you know where it's one of the great things about about kind of this lifestyle and being able to pick, literally pick up your home and go spend a month or a summer uh living someplace else is realizing that the, the risks change uh for yeah. your pet depending on where you go so that's good advice this this next uh slide here just, just a way, all sorts of resources online to understand where different risks live. So walk us through this and uh, how folks should use it. Yeah, so um, this is, I guess, a really good example of how we approach things. So we live in a white zone of, of heartworm and we probably live in kind of the place that's least because we are at elevation as well. So um, there are there is very, very low risk of heartworm where we are, particularly through the winter months. Um, but if we were to go anywhere that had color on it, um, at a time of year where we knew that the season was also kind of conducive to that mosquito living, we would start our heartworm, you know, before we traveled and give them time, like don't do it the night before you go, give them some time to kind of build it up. Our vet says they recommend a monthly dose, so you want to be dosing kind of at least a fortnight before you um, before you leave but um, you actually do get slightly longer out of those doses that they don't put on the pack but we would always say right we're leaving for a pink zone in, in a, a few weeks time we start our heartworm now and and for some people that may not be as convenient they would maybe rather just do it the whole time that's totally a personal thing but we prefer to just manage those things and keep him kind of ready um, for what he's about to face rather than just kind of blanketly on autopilot going through those those steps so the as we go through this the relationship with your home vet, the veterinarian uh, very important yeah. but also needing needing to know where to go if you do need vet care yeah. uh, while you're on the way particularly kind of finding those resources in advance what are some of the ways that people can do that. Yes. Yeah, so Mark made a really good point about this the other day um, when we were doing a run through and I, you could even say it, I could shut up for two minutes and no, but he can't remember what it was. So, um, so um, we, um, 
we always look ahead at what kind of places we're going to. And even though we may be, at, we're a bit wanderlusty, we, we do sometimes go places that are unexpected. We know that um, Blue Pearl offers some great vet, emergency vet services and they have a great range of services. There's about, uh, I, think there's, I think there's 90 locations of Blue Pearl across the states. Um, they are, so that's really, really good. Um, but there is also um, Emergency Vets Online, which is like a directory of emergency vets. I think, Carly, I made a note of that somewhere. So it'll be in, in the text somewhere. Um, and so always making sure that we have thought ahead about where we're going and is there going to be a blue pearl? If not, what is available there? When it comes to places like Moab, which we would go quite often, um, we always make sure that the, the clinic that is there, we know which ones have things like rattlesnake vaccine, because there are certain things that not all vet clinics will do. So if you are going somewhere and you're particularly worried about something, I would absolutely call ahead. And it, you know, there is no harm in asking. That is one thing we have learned when traveling when in doubt just ask and um, people will generally be very very helpful so if we get to an area and we come across some other dog people were like oh who's a great vet in the area so just using those kind of networks and contacts and then there's always you know the internet of everything um, that you can help find or those things and you know the, the animal um, hospital locators are online through lots of different sites Three, three quick builds on this. Uh, first one is I actually had to look up what Fortnite was because I'm like, ooh, I know it's a video oh. game, but what else is it? So two, two, two weeks, right? Two weeks is what we're talking about in terms yeah, of yeah, two know, weeks. kind of ramping up there. So that a good uh, good explanation on that. Um, Blue Pearl, just want to call it to folks. There's no, no commercial affiliation between you know, us and them, just a nationwide network of, of vet hospitals. I assume one of the benefits of finding a provider like, like that that has nationwide coverage is that the, the records will follow you around, right? Exactly. So you're able to kind of look up the records from the And always ask for the records when you leave. Even if they even if they say, oh no, we keep it on file, say, I'd like a copy of that so that I can put it in his file. Richie right. had a really, um, he actually had a bout of Giardia, which we didn't really, it, it kind of came on in a, an odd way. It turned out to be Giardia. Um, and so it was really useful. Um, Blue Pearl was where we ended up. And um, they were really good about giving us the follow-up treatment mm -hmm. recommendations. And I think before you leave, just make sure that you, you keep those ducks in a row. Um, remember which clinic you went to in case you do need to call back. So good, good things to consider. And then the notes that you put in here for that other directory for folks is emergency vet. USA. Yeah, emergency, yeah. emergency Vets USA. So yeah, emergency that, vets, and that, yeah. that should pop right up. Yeah. So this, this next one, I knew that this service existed for humans. <laughs> I was uh, you know, happy to see that it, it, is, it, it exists for animals as well. Walk us through mm -hmm. what this is and how folks can use it. Well, isn't this just all of our worst nightmare? I mean, it is, you know, your pet ingests something. Now, it could be something quite, you know, um, innocuous that you don't really even think of, like a waterborne, um, so Giardia or beaver, beaver fever, as they call it. Um, but more so um, if they scavenge some, uh, this is often scavenging uh, behavior and they eat something that has um, been poisoned. Now coming again, if I share some New Zealand experience, um, because of our flightless bird population, control of rodents and, and also things like rabbits and possums and things like that, um, New Zealand does some pretty nasty things with poisons out in the environment. So we are hyper vigilant about any kind of scavenging behavior. Um, so the um, ASPCA does have a poison control hotline that you can call. I highly recommend having that number in your phone. Again, it is, if it's an emergency, you just want to be able to, to find it straight away. Um, there are, you know, um, if you see what they eat and your uh, yeah, it looks kind of uh oh, then make maybe take it with you. I know it's gross, but often that will help um, to identify um, what the poison is. Um, some say induced vomiting. If you are traveling with your cat, now I can't speak to goats, rats, pigs, or anything parrots. like parrots, 
but um, but if you are traveling with a cat, please do not try and induce vomiting in a cat. Um, that is not a good idea. You can do it in dogs, but I would still call animal poison control before I even did that, um, just to make sure that you're not doing more harm than good. So um, the, it's the hydrogen peroxide solution, 3%, and the formula is about 15 milliliters. Sorry, it's not fluid ounces. I'm still in metric. Um, uh, sorry, it's about one and a half milliliters. Sorry, it's about half to one milliliters per pound of body weight, but up to a maximum of um, nine teaspoons. So don't kind of go in there. So you just kind of drop that into the dog and, and that should they should vomit within 15 minutes. I would, I perish the thought that I ever have to do that. Um, but advice would be have this number in your phone call it if you're worried and stop your dog scavenging and that's where the leashing comes in as well if they are if they do it at home they're going to do it on the road so um you know a good leave it command uh is is a great thing to have prevention is always better than cure and i mean we always know if we just start to eat grass that there's even something you shouldn't have so yeah keep an eye out for that yeah yeah it's, it's a good good things for folks to consider Google that that formula for inducing vomiting on the on the internet, just so folks can can have the details in front of them. Yeah, That's such and a please, um, there, sorry, just Chris, there are some other things that people do about putting salt on the back of their tongue, giving them salt water. Those things are not widely recommended by veterinarians, um, just because salt can really upset the electrolyte balance. So it is um, hydrogen peroxide three percent solution is the one that most vets would say they would endorse or they would support. Awesome. Thanks for the clarity there. Walk us, let's touch quickly on what's going on uh, on this mm -hmm. slide. Oh, wow. Talk about experiences. Uh, so uh, we took Reacher to rattlesnake aversion training. Um, so rattlesnake uh, bites, obviously a nasty thing, mostly uh, arise out of dogs being curious and going in to sniff uh, and then getting bitten, disturbing a rattlesnake and, and getting bitten. Rattlesnakes don't tend to hunt dogs. Um, they tend, dogs just tend to kind of interrupt the rattlesnake's day and the rattlesnake bites them. So um, there are antivenoms available. Um, they are time sensitive. So the rattlesnake vaccine basically gives you more time to get to a vet to administer the, the antidote. However, if the vet doesn't have the antidote um, then you still, that, that rattlesnake vaccine isn't actually going to necessarily save your dog. We went a behavioral approach. Um, so basically introduced Reacher to a rattlesnake so that he is no longer curious and then created an aversion to it using a stim collar. The guy who did this in Utah is absolutely amazing. And I am sure that um, rattlesnake aversion um, on Google uh, will bring up his... Um, his details, and I'm sure he can refer to other places around the US that do this. Um, literally, um, Reacher would not go near a rattlesnake now if it was waving a sausage at him. He's like, nope, bad things happen. Don't trust them, not going near them. So um, yeah, they introduce them to the scent and then they create the aversion using the stim collar. It's not easy. But uh, we now, uh, and they will retest your dog for free every year if you like to make sure that they are still, yeah, no, not going near a rattlesnake. Those things are mean. So I think two fun facts, 60% of adult rattlesnake bites are, are dry, dry and they can control the venom, whereas juvenile snakes, you're in for a lot of pain. Yeah, juvenile snakes just go all out. They, just, they all go, yeah. <laughs> So, so yeah. So this was a really interesting and, and you know, very valuable. I mean, right here where we are now, there are there is a rattlesnake den not even half a mile from here. Um, but we are pretty confident that Reacher would have no curiosity after doing the training. What a what a great great resource. This mm -hmm. this next slide talks about some of the the must haves. Again, uh, some you know some items here focused on on dogs, but just in general, some concepts here to to take mm -hmm. away from 
another disclaimer here, uh, no relationship with any of these brands. Uh, <laughs> these are just, you know, folks that you guys have used uh, you know, previously and had good success with. So walk us through this slide. Yeah. So these, I mean, obviously a pet first aid kit um, is, is good to have. And that will have things like syringes and saline and alcohol wipes and tweezers and a thermometer and a really good pet first aid kit. Um, definitely have that. Some of the other things in there are kind of are my favorite things. Um, a large scarf. You would be amazed at what you can do with just a large light piece of fabric. Mine's $10 from the Gap. I have used it as a cool rack. I've used it as a tourniquet. I've used it as a sling to help a dog who was having trouble getting over some terrain. Um, I've used it as a hammock to carry a small dog when it got tired. And so my, I've used it um, as a temporary shade. So all of those things from just a $10 scarf from The Gap and uh, absolutely worth its weight in gold. Uh, Vet wrap bandage is a first aid kit in a roll. I always carry that when I am hiking. Um, and we walk dogs for other people as well. So we're again, quite safety minded. Um, it, it can be used, you can make a temporary boot, you can um, staunch a wound, you can make a muzzle, you can use it as a leash or a spare collar. Um, there are so many things. So that's just basically a veterinary adhesive stretchy bandage and that stuff is a first aid kit in a roll. Don't leave home without it. Um, the shampoo, um, Reacher sleeps with us. And if he's been doing some nasty stuff, we're feeding the little hose out the side of the airstream. And that was a key selling feature for us, I have to say. Um, uh, and that particular shampoo, whatever brand you choose, uh, lavender and calendula are also really, really good uh, if there's been any irritation to the skin. They calm it. They've got a slight antimicrobial effect. If you need to pull out the big guns, you use something like a Hibber cleanse, which is a, it's an anti microbial wash but this is just much more um kind of better for their sensitive skin so always have some shampoo not just for making him more pleasant to be around but if I feel he's been somewhere and maybe he was picking up some slight allergens then I'll give him a nice bath and something quite soothing um, we had a, a saying in the horse world, no hoof, no horse. Well, no paw, no dog. Uh, so paw wounds are horrible um, when they get them or even just abrasions. Um, Richie gets regular foot spas, uh, toenails uh, to stop him from scratching the floors and, the, and things in the camper. And also um, really nice, and there's, there are loads of these available, really nice paw balms that keep the, um, the tissues of their paws um, and those pads super elastic and soft and hydrated. Um, so it provides some barrier against ice and snow or also shale and really dry ground. Um, and, it, and so, it, but also if you use it more like a, a treatment, then it also helps really build strong pore pads. Uh, we use Mush's Secret. If it's good enough for the Iditarod dogs, it's good enough for us. Uh, we've got a hilarious video of trying to get boots on Reacher. Um, it's just, it's just, it's good for TikTok, but it's not good for getting out the door. And I, I've lost more boots than I've, um, than I've <laughs> count. So we really rely on his paws being in great condition and we cover some miles. We really do hike a lot. Um, we carry a long line, so a 20 foot long line, that's just if he can have some more freedom, um, but we do want to keep an eye on him. So, and it also is really good. Mark had to use it the other day. Uh, we had a dog that decided to climb a snowbank downhill and then couldn't get back up again. So we had to kind of rig up a, a, a line to get this dog back up a hill again. And the final thing, um, we're quite big on picking up after our dog. Um, we think it's a great luxury to be able to take him the places we do. So we always have a leash with a pouch on it. Um, in that we carry poop bags, but more importantly, we carry a little card that has um, contact details. And again, a third person who is not with us that can be contacted in an emergency. If anything should happen to either of us on the trail, as long as we've got that, we at least know that we're not Jane Doe's kind of missing persons. I really don't want my face on a milk carton. So um, we really um, we really make sure that we have our ID information on our person as well as on Reach's collar. So they're my must-haves. They're my, maybe you would never have thought of it, but they're really good to have.
Awesome. Uh, let's hop ahead here just to keep an eye on time. Oh, Talk a little bit about, about planning. No, lots of great information here. So, um, you know, a lot of folks here are like, how can I know where to take my pet? Um, so what are some of the resources that you guys use? This is going to be slide number 18 uh, on your notes there. What are some of the resources that you guys use on the, on the planning front? Um, so we use, we are members of Harvest Hosts, which is a beautiful resource and you do get to stay in some really lovely and unusual places. Highly recommend checking that out. Um, we're also members of Hip Camp, which provides some private land camping and then the KOA as well. So we do a mix of staying on BLM land and boondocking. Uh, we do some state parks, particularly up here in the winters. Um, the KOA ways are great a lot of them are pet friendly and have great facilities and we've had really we've met great people had great experiences there um, and it's really nice to be able to fill up your tanks and empty your tanks and clean and do your laundry and and have a really amazing shower and all of that kind of stuff after you've been dusty for three days um, so we would use those as resources for for what we do mark and i often play a game called gps roulette where we just kind of put something in the gps and just go and oh it might be nice Nice. you know um it works out sometimes other times not so much but that's how i found the psychiatric museum in, in missouri so there you go um a great site for dog lovers is bring fido uh, really encourage you not just to use this as a resource but be a contributor because if you have done that trail or if you have stayed at that place or if you've found this thing please put it on there because it really helps the whole kind of traveling community and it does rely on kind of um peer-to-peer -peer, um, feedback so don't just use it to find stuff actually make those reviews um, and you know there's obviously the Air Strait and Base Camp owner group which is a fabulous group and I'm sure there are ones for um, other other models and things like that and people are constantly sharing information on those as well so uh, we we would put it out to the group um, interestingly we get a lot of invitations to come and stay places and just a, a, if you are listening um, we are open for invitations but also um, if you invite us we likely will show up so just be aware you can't just make a throwaway invitation because a New Zealander will show up probably with beer so there you go <laughs> great, great stuff. I know for some of the other owner groups, you know, uh, uh, making sure everyone's familiar with them. Airstream Addicts is a, is a really popular one kind of across the Airstream product portfolio. Mm -hmm. And to your point, there's one for the, the touring coach group. So uh, lots of good groups out there to, to crowdsource some answers to. This next slide is actually a screenshot from Airstream put together a public lands guide. So all the things you should know. Uh, when camping on public lands. We just grabbed a screenshot from there because it, it really went through the, the four types of lands that we cover in that, um, in that overview. And we're just highlighting the piece here specific to pets. So in the National Forest, you can see that pets are allowed in developed areas only. Uh, Bureau of Land Management, you know, dogs are off, allowed off leash in undeveloped areas, on leash and campgrounds in developed areas, Army Corps of Engineers, Dogs must be leashed in developed areas and then national parks. Um, always best to check with all these, but at least mm -hmm. on the, the, the broadest uh, level, you know, dogs are allowed in developed areas only, but always good to check in advance. Uh, call the, the district or park ranger to, to understand what the rules are at that specific park. Angela, you had one one build to this slide too, I think. Yeah, I, I really feel um, having, I come from New Zealand where it is not as dog friendly as here and finding these incredible places that we can take our dog I do feel a really big responsibility to, to caretake that um, cleaning up after ourselves and also cleaning up if other people don't I know that people say the poop fairy doesn't exist well she does and here she is because <laughs> I, I re, you are so incredibly lucky in the ways that you can take your dogs places here in the US um, we just have to, we have a responsibility to, to nurture that and to make and to protect it because it really it's, it's, it's a wonderful luxury never take it for granted um, we always err on the side of caution when it comes to to leashing 
for not just safety reasons, um, but also understanding that not everybody else um, appreciates a really friendly dog coming up to them. So we are, and then there is, you know, the scavenging or getting into water or anything like that. So we do have a really big responsibility, not just to our own dogs, but also to the communities that we're part of. And so, yeah, I would really encourage people to always err on the side of caution um, when it comes to leashing your dog in these areas and, and just being a good, being a good human um, and being good to your dog. The, the, I'm going to put you on the spot to tell a story that we, that you shared in your run through when you guys were at the hotel. All right. Uh, I thought, I thought that was great. If you could just briefly cover that. Yeah, so uh, we uh, had a tray, we had, our base camp was full of stock, so we had to stay in a hotel uh, and uh, we pulled in and, and Reacher um, on his schedule that he has maintained goes out to do his business and I pick up his and then I noticed that there was a whole lot of others that people just had not picked up in the pet area at the hotel. So I went about and I cleaned them all up and the receptionist of the hotel uh, was looking out the window, she saw me doing this I was out there for about 20 minutes and she saw me doing it and when I came back in she goes thank you so much we've made a note on your file your dog is now free to stay at any one of our hotels and in any of our chains because you are the kind of people that we want um, in our network and I was like wow so just just be a good person and good things will follow so That's some right. of those sites will say dogs up to 50, 60 pounds, but always ask. I mean, yeah, we've been to places where the maximum limit was 30 pounds. <laughs> yeah, we rock up with a hundred pounds of bridge back. And so, <laughs> so but we we haven't had any problems, so we're good. Here's a, a just a quick slide to, to visualize some of the conversation that we're talking about today. This is actually a website that's maintained by the National Park Service. Uh, there's a link on the bottom left, but this allows you to visually see where are pets generally allowed? Where are they not allowed? Um, and you can search there at the top right just to kind of dig into um, specific uh, details at each location. Okay. So to that end, uh, you know, some questions coming in on uh, which we're gonna get to on, hey, what do I do when I leave and wanna leave the pet behind? So we're gonna mm -hmm. talk about that, that tech and some approaches to that here in a minute. But quickly tell us about your, your three favorite spots, maybe to inspire folks on where they can go with their dog or with That's their pet. It's almost like asking me to choose a favorite dog. Yeah, that's quite hard. But because uh, there is so much to see and do here. Um, we obviously, Southern Utah is close to us and it is incredible down there. It is, it's so beautiful. And there's just so much open space and there's nobody there. So we really do love Southern Utah. Um, we've spent some time in the Dakotas um, that we, uh, and particularly around the Mount Rushmore area and out the back of there that we absolutely loved. Um, and one place we have not been but is totally on the list and if anyone is calling in from this area feel free to extend an invitation no pressure uh, is the Ozarks and kind of those those kind of southeastern areas we haven't done that yet um, with any detail we blew through it once and we just really really want to go back so um, those would be some of our, our top picks and when you're going there what are some of the ways that people should should uh, travel with their their pet. I know in the picture here is a dog. Same would apply to a cat or a goat or a pig or whatever folks are traveling with. Um, walk us through this slide. Yeah, so um, this is absolutely our kind of preference. And people may disagree, and even Mark and I sometimes disagree between ourselves. Um, we, uh, Reacher travels really, really comfortably in the back of our Ford Explorer. When we purchased it, one of the key things, it's got its own air conditioning kind of unit. So he's climate controlled in the back, which is very nice. And he's got loads of space. And he's an incredible traveler. He just sleeps. And so he is, he's great there. Um, the key thing for me is that whatever your animal, whether it's your goat or your rat, it is contained and calm in the car because 
a, an excited animal is a distraction and that is that in itself is unsafe and then of course should the worst happen they do they become projectiles if, if they're not locked in increasingly there are some there are some products that are coming onto the market the Orvis um, and also Kurgo do quite good backseat hammocks if you prefer your dog to travel in the back seat with you um, and there are some quite good seat belt clips um, my own only thing with either of those two things, if you're using a seat belt um, clip or your dog is in the back seat, um, don't ever attach that leash or that um, uh, that seat belt to their flat collar, to a pinch collar, to a slip collar, a harness only for a couple of reasons. One, it's really uncomfortable for your dog to constantly have something pulling on its neck. And secondly, if there is a breaking kind of incident, um, then all of that pressure is going through their throat. And that is far, that, is, that could be a worse situation than them not being restrained at all. So yeah, if you are going to use any restraint, please put your dog in a harness. The Stunt Puppy Go Dog Glow harness was never designed as a seat belt harness, but actually the way it's constructed works really, really well as a seat belt um, attachment. So um, that, that's the one that we use. And I think there might be pictures of Betty, um, the little miniature bull terrier in here wearing hers um, in the back of the car so um, yeah keep them contained whether it's they're just sleeping in the back or they are secured um, the other thing is a crate um, and that would be you know a crate secured in the back of the car is great um, but they are bulky and they can get really hot and there's a whole other issue with crates so um, I yeah our preference is Reacher is, is in the back asleep but as long as they're calm preferably restrained and absolutely please please because it breaks my heart don't let them travel outside the vehicle with their body hanging out the vehicle um I might I might toot at you angrily and it's one of the few things that I do that gets me upset that and dogs and into hot cars <laughs> And, and full disclosure here, I know we've been pretty explicit about no commercial relationship. Yeah. Uh, Want to be transparent. You guys own Stunt Puppy. We own we'll Stunt talk Puppy. a little bit about um, just your approach and what you guys do when it comes to making uh, some gear. So uh, this next slide is, you know, people want to know where where should I, you know, where should I put my pet to sleep? And I know going back to consistency earlier, there's some some things that we can uh, pull through from the home experience into the airship experience. Yeah, so um, Reacher, when we are when we are in the base camp, um, he does actually sleep um, up on the bed with us. He, um, we're fortunate, being from New Zealand, we're tiny uh, little hobbits, not hairy feet, but we we are little. Uh, so we sleep across the airstream, and he has the bit at the back. We were camping in Colorado. Um, uh, we were at a hip campsite actually, and it was so so hot. And so we wanted to have just the mesh screens across, not the doors actually closed. And um, and I was like, oh, do you, do you think it's safe? And it's like, we've got a hundred pounds of bridge back here. You know, no one's gonna get through this thing. I lay awake all night worrying about bears. Um, but uh, he does sleep in the bed with us. Um, hopefully will alert us should anything um, come around the camper. Um, but he will sleep anywhere that we put his mat. So even when he sleeps on the bed there, we put his little sheepskin that we bought out from New Zealand. He it came with him. It goes on the bed and that's where he sleeps. So he always knows exactly where he can sleep. Um, uh, Betty, on the other hand, um, she's horrible to sleep with. She's not our dog, but we sometimes take her with us. And um, she actually sleeps in a little crate on the floor. She's happier, we're happier, and she's completely thermonuclear, so we all get too hot if she's in the bed. So, yeah, so Richard sleeps in the bed with us, but he, it's whether it's a crate, a mat, or whatever, as long as they have a place, then they should be happy. And, and you'll actually take the, the, the bed or sleeping mat that he has from home. Okay. to make sure that it's consistent that's right yep. so i'm gonna i'm gonna skip ahead again a bit just to make sure we have some time to cover so i'm going to go to slide 26 which is other things to consider um you know when you're traveling with a pet so this first one some questions have actually come through during the presentation today on what's the best way to actually leave my pet or what's, what are some things mm -hmm. i should consider when leaving my pet this one is a you know, pragmatic thing everyone should do. And then we'll talk about some technology to, to fill this in. Um, but this one is, a, we just grabbed an example of someone who has already created this already. Um, right. But making sure that if someone sees your pet inside and something is wrong, um, that they know who to contact. 
Uh, yes. what, what do you guys do here? Yeah, uh, build on this, Angela. Yeah, so um, there are some compromises or some concessions you make when traveling um, with a pet. And one of those, and, and Mark and I have this, um, if he wants, if we were going to go for a, like a long bike ride or something, then we would go separately or so that one of us can stay behind. So, the, you know, we tend not to leave Reacher for long periods of time. He would be absolutely fine. I would probably be a wreck because I'm like, oh, what if the gas explodes or what if the, you know, that the air conditioning fails or whatever. So we tend not to leave him for long periods of time, particularly during the day. If we are leaving him, um, we would never tether him outside. Um, some people do. It is not our way. It's, you know, we just don't, we just don't know um, how safe um, he would be. So we would never tether him. Um, but we yeah, definitely make sure that people know that he's in there, he's got ventilation, um, and only a few hours at a time. And lastly, make sure that he's tired, so that he's just going to go in and sleep. Um, and again, if you know your dog, if your dog is great at just cruising around at home, then it'll probably be pretty good in the camper as well. Make sure you put away any food because it is a different situation. Make sure you put away any food that could be toxic. If you've been, you know, eating your dark chocolate, watching Yellowstone um, the night before, make sure that dark chocolate's locked away because you just don't kind of know what, what could happen. And it's different than in a kitchen at home. So, um, yeah, so only a few hours, not during the heat of the day. Um, and if one person has to stay behind, just read a book and enjoy spending time with your dog. That's what, that's what we do. I quite enjoy it when he goes off by himself. I mean, we have left them with the aircon going if we're in a powered site. Yeah. Um, for a couple of hours. Yeah. yeah. There is also, you know, if there's a dog daycare and, and you're comfortable with doing that, then you could always do that if you, you know, had a big day planned. Um, so, but again, make sure you've got your up to date vaccinations. And they may also require that you have a, a poop test that shows they have no internal parasites. So, make sure that you have that documentation if you do think you are going to be using a doggy daycare. Some technology can always make this easier. Just to walk through some some of the items on this slide. So a lot of folks ask like, hey, how can I keep an eye on my pet when I'm not there? Mm -hmm. um, generally, a lot of the questions that we see come into two buckets. How can I make sure that the temperature stays safe for my pet? So that could either be too hot or too cold, depending on the season and where you're camping. So there are a handful of connected temperature sensors that you can monitor through your app. You can set alerts if it gets too hot or too cold. So if you're away from the Airstream, you can keep an eye on what the temperature is inside the vehicle. Uh, and then another layer on top of that is you know, just keeping an eye visually with some of the cameras that exist or common in, in, um, in regular homes uh, to be able to keep an eye on your pet when you're not there. So those are just a couple of the things that, that I know that folks use. Do you you also use uh, something else uh, in addition in terms of a GPS tracker, right? Well, so we, at the moment, this is quite new technology and it's really only just kind of come to my attention over about the last six months. And it's super exciting because it does begin to do some, some really cool things. And I don't have any affiliation to this particular collar, but it's been coming through my Facebook um, over the last six months um, and I did some research it's called Halo and it's again one of these things that does multiple duties and however you feel about electronic collars or electronic fences is, is, is really up to you but this actually does it's a GPS tracker it also allows you to set perimeter fences. So even if you're not, so we would probably only do this if we were with him, but you can actually set up using your phone and you can do it ahead of time, a little zone around your camper. Um, and if the dog goes near the zone, it can get a warning or, and or you can get a warning that your dog is, is going near whatever boundary you have set. And then if they do for whatever reason cross the boundary, then you've got the GPS tracker layered on top of that. And so it is, it's not cheap. It's, I think, depending on the deal they're offering at the time, it's around $700. Um, but um, it gives you, you can use it at home as a perimeter fence. You can use it as a 
a learning necklace, as some people call them, or a training collar. Um, and then when you go on the road, you've got this extra layer of being able to set these things up on the fly. So um, I think the subscription started about seven cents a day. Um, and you can up and downgrade your subscriptions depending on what you need at a particular time. So they've thought it out pretty well. And I, I would be really interested to see if anyone else um, has heard of it or has any experience with it. Because, you know, it breaks my heart when I see things come through um, you know, my own social feeds, you know, lost dog in Escalante last seen two days ago. And it's like, oh, it's heartbreaking. So that's one way of, of, of addressing that. Richard doesn't like to go more than 20 meters from his food bowl. So we just pretty much put that in the center of the campsite and know that you won't go any further than 20 meters from it. 20 yards, sorry, metric again. <laughs> it's okay. Uh, quickly walk us through this slide and I wanna make sure I mm -hmm. give you a little bit uh, of time to talk about uh, Stump Up because I know we also have a promo code for Airstream Supply Company and 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 Stump Up as well. Cool. Um, we always take plenty of food. Um, you just don't want to be again scrambling around looking for food um, on the road, particularly for dogs on a specific kind of diet. So we always take plenty of food with us. We also try to not let Richard drink um, from water sources that we don't know. That includes um, like water bowls outside cafes or anything like that. Just because of things like Giardia, maybe leptospirosis, you're just, just minimizing that risk is such a great way just to think. So we always carry our own water. There's two bowls on there. Um, we use stainless steel bowls for food because you can get them nice and clean, but that Taurus bowl and Chewy off Often has those on sale as a brilliant travel bowl. Um, no affiliation with them at all, except that we, we use them and give, give them as gifts to almost everyone with a dog. Um, the outside of the bowl is a reservoir, holds about two litres, or you can get a smaller one for a smaller dog that holds about one litre. It only allows a certain amount of water into the bowl at a time, and it goes through a carbon filter. So you've got nice, fresh, clean water kind of coming into the bowl just in smaller amounts. So you're not it's not sloshing about all over the place you can lock it off so in the car for example you can have that bowl locked off and then just open it it allows a little bit of water go in you lock it off again they have a drink and you're not wasting lots of water so that is that Taurus bowl is is definitely worth looking into and the one I carry with us when we're on the move is the little stunt puppy nano bowl. It's a chemical free soft bowl. It's light. It takes up no room at all. Um, and um, it's super easy to clean and launder. You can put it through the dishwasher or the washing machine or just really hot soapy water. So it stays really nice and clean. And we use that when we're on the trail. So we've always got, um, and I, gosh, my fitness level goes through the roof in the summer because I'm schlepping about liters and liters and liters <laughs> of water um and, and and I I object to tipping it out on the trail I'm like you will drink it you you ungrateful dog <laughs> I carried this for three hours you will drink well, it <laughs> well I want to uh, thank you guys both for taking the time to join us we're we're at the top of the hour I wanted to you know, just call out the two two promo codes for folks who have joined us today uh on the left is Airstream Supply Company on the right is your company that, that you and Mark have so passionately created called Stump Puppy. Encourage folks to go check it out. Uh, learn more about your approach to, to what you've done in terms of the gear you've created. I think you've called it the Patagonia for, yep. for dogs. So Patagonia um, for dogs. I, I uh, hope folks will take the time to, uh, to check out both uh, offers, but thanks so much for joining us and we'll see you guys next time. Thank you. Thank you so much for having us.